Hi, I'm Wendy Kelman, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Open Mind program, sponsored by UCLA's Friends of the Semmel Institute, the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors, and WOW, the Wonder of Women. We are thrilled that you are here, and we hope that you find today's Weight of Gold program informative and inspiring. For those of you with us for the first time, The Open Mind is our educational series that brings together thought leaders in science and culture to present free programs about mental health issues. In addition to supporting The Open Mind, the Friends of Semmel awards yearly research grants to early career neuroscientists and has just launched the Open Mind Film Festival for high school students in Los Angeles County. You can learn more about all of these programs on our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org. We are honored to have with us today, Brett Rapkin, the producer, writer, and director of Weight of Gold, the HBO Sports critically acclaimed new documentary film created in partnership with Michael Phelps that explores the mental health challenges facing Olympic athletes. He is also the Emmy award-winning filmmaker of Welcome to Dodgertown and the founder and president of Podium Pictures, a production company focused on impact sports films that can inspire change. We are also excited to welcome Sasha Cohen, one of the most accomplished figure skaters of our time. Sasha won the silver medal at the 2006 Olympic Winter Games in Torino, Italy. And that same year, she won the US championship. We are also honored to welcome Dr. Talin Babikian, a clinical neuropsychologist and associate professor at UCLA Semmel Institute's Department of Psychiatry. She is associate director at UCLA's Brain Sport Program where she oversees the neuropsychological services of its multidisciplinary concussion program, specializing in youth and professional athletes with brain injuries. Dr. Babikian will, re- will moderate today's discussion. A few housekeeping notes. Our program will consist of a series of curated clips from Weight of Gold, interspersed with conversation and comments from our discussants. The program is being recorded and can be viewed tomorrow on our website. There you will also find videos from past Open Mind programs, along with a calendar of upcoming events you won't want to miss. Everyone's Zoom has been automatically set to mute, and we ask that it remain muted throughout the program. Today's program will run for approximately one hour and 15 minutes with the last 15 minutes reserved for your questions. Please be sure to type them into the Q&A located at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will do our very best to get to as many questions as possible. In conclusion, today is Giving Tuesday, the National Day of Giving Back. If you feel that our Open Mind programs provide a valuable free service to the public, much like NPR or public television, we hope you will consider supporting our work if you're able. A donation link can be found on our website or to make it even easier, you can join our community of supporters by clicking on the link you will receive in our thank you email tomorrow. Please know that every dollar matters and no donation is too small or too large. And now we'll begin with a preview of Weight of Gold, and then we'll welcome Sasha, Brett, and Talim. All right. Um, Right, it's a really powerful film. I've watched it a few times now, and I find myself glued to every phrase and word that's spoken and presented 
And I know we're going to take some time and go through um, various segments of the film. But before we do that, I'm wondering if you can share with us um, a little bit about the origins of the project, whether you had a personal interest in mental health and athletes, and what impact you were wanting to make with the film. Sure. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the discussion. It's great to be here. And I'm really grateful to be playing a, a small part um, in, in such an important conversation that uh, has always been important and, and was, uh, has gotten on, only more important and crucial uh, during the events of, of 2020. Um, this film really had, I call it, three different phases. Uh, it started off as, as just intending to do a short documentary film about Stephen Holcomb, who was the, the captain of the Olympic bobsled team. And we put together, we did two shoots with him. One was in Lake Placid, New York, where he lived and trained at the Olympic Training Center. And the other was a big uh, three hour interview we did in, in, uh, in Santa Monica. Um, and 12 days after our, our interview with Stephen, I received a call that, that he had passed away uh, at the Olympic Training Center. He had attempted suicide in 2007. Uh, and the story that we planned to tell was about how he had survived that, won a gold medal in Vancouver in 2010, two more medals in 2014, and was preparing for 2018. And after he passed away, um, I discovered this uh, post-Olympic depression phenomenon in my research and decided at that time to expand it into a broader film that would cover just the emotional roller coaster that this particular group of athletes endure with the every four years and, and different challenges uh, and did uh, a bunch of interviews at that time, including with Sasha in New York. Um, and it was only after I started really sitting down with these athletes that I started to, to learn and was frankly shocked um, to, to learn uh, some of the resources that were, uh, in their opinion, missing from, from the organizations that were in charge of supporting them. And so then the film also took on that dynamic. How did you meet Sasha and how did you pick the remainder of the athletes that you feature in the film? It was a really organic process. You know, I mean, certain athletes had, uh, you know, spoken publicly about uh, mental health. You know, Michael, maybe most notably in recent years, uh, I think Michael really laid a lot of the groundwork for uh, a lot of these other athletes, including uh, UCLA's own Kevin Love, who's also been a tremendous uh, uh, speaker on the subject. But, you know, I, I, had, um, I had traveled Europe with Bodie Miller, the Olympic ski racer, and remained good friends with him and, and also knew Jeremy Bloom and had met Sasha briefly in, in Vancouver when I was there uh, in 2010 with, with Bodie. Um, Sasha, I don't know if you remember that shot of tequila we took, but I certainly <laughs> do. Um, but it was really organic. Uh, athletes started introducing me to their friends who wanted to talk about it and Soon enough, I'd start getting phone calls. Hey, Brett, it's, it's Lolo Jones. Uh, I'm here in Baton Rouge, but I heard you're doing a shoot in New York tomorrow, and I'm prepared to get on a flight in an hour if you can uh, include me in, in this film. So that's how it expanded. We're the beneficiaries of that. Why don't we watch a little bit more um, of the film, and then we can chat. So there's definitely uh, a thrill and ex excitement and quite a bit going on behind the scenes that the public, Sasha, isn't privy to. Um, and I imagine that there's a healthy level of anxiety that's needed to be able to, to muster up the courage for that kind of focus. Can you walk us through what it's like in that final countdown leading up to a big performance like that in front of the world stage and how um, you would suggest to a younger junior athlete to balance out that healthy level of anxiety um, versus paralyzing anxiety or panic? In certain events, like an Olympic trials or an Olympic games, you, 
you really feel the, uh, the, just the immense pressure because you know it's a once in a lifetime moment and the body can really distinguish what is a, um, a practice event or a Grand Prix that doesn't have these kind of ultimate consequences versus an Olympic games that might come you know, once every four years and for most athletes really just once um, as the pinnacle of their career. And, and so in that moment, you, you've thought about it since you were five years old and you've dreamed about what it might be like um, standing on top of the podium and you've done mental visual, visualizations every day and you've trained and you've tried to be as prepared as you can be in the moment. And then ultimately this moment that you never think will really come arrives. And I don't think the mind can quite organize and process that in, in real time. And so I think as an athlete, you try to, to trust your training, uh, both physical and mental, and you try as best you can to stay in the present moment uh, because it's so easy to get overwhelmed with the hundreds of millions of people that are watching live around the world and the expectations and the, you know, the minor slip of a blade that could change everything. And so I think it's very hard to not feel that intensity of pressure in, in those moments. Uh, and my advice, I guess, to a young athlete coming up would be that you have trained for this um, mentally and physically, and it's an opportunity of a lifetime. And when you, you look back um, over your life, it's, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, the medals that you win that will define your athletic career, but what you've learned um, emotionally and physically and the relationships that you've cultivated as an athlete um, and to, you know, as much as you can take it with a grain of salt, because it's the most tremendous opportunity to compete on this Olympic stage, representing your country. And, you know, if you can enjoy it, because it goes by so quickly and you're, you're certainly not guaranteed, um, you know, a second shot or second experience at an Olympic games. Is there, um, room for mentorship. So I imagine that in team sports, any kind of disappointment or challenge may be, the burdens of that may be um, shared by teammates, but in solo sports, you don't have that. So I'm wondering, um, looking back, would it be helpful to have not just a coach or a trainer, but someone, a role model that, that can help a younger, um, rising athlete be able to deal with the emotional challenges of um, performance and what to expect on a, on a big stage like that? Certainly. And I think it is very different for a solo athlete versus someone that competes in a team sport. There isn't that camaraderie and solidarity with, with teammates. You know, it's your coach walks you up to, you know, that the barriers, the entry from when you step onto the ice and then it's you, it's on your shoulders. And I think that's really tough as a young kid or a teenager to be alone with the weight of the expectations, um, both internal and external alongside, you know, that voice in your head that said, this is it, this is the moment. And to be able to talk to athletes that are five years ahead, 20 years ahead, and I think get that perspective uh, I think, I think athletes would enjoy their Olympics experience a little bit more. And I think, you know, obviously my experience doesn't apply, you know, formally to all athletes. Uh, we competed at the very end of the games and then it was closing ceremonies and we went home. So we were nervous the whole time. Whereas some athletes that competed in the first few days had a week and a half to party and enjoy and bond and, you know, therefore had a very different kind of Olympic experience. Uh, but I think when I look back, I really take away just how special it was to be competing on such an elite stage with other athletes that had, uh, you know, a similar set of circumstances, the sacrifice, the focus, the goals, and and how, how special it was. Because I think when you're in it, all you see is like the weight of expectation and what you need to deliver at that games. Um, and so if you talk to someone that was 10 years out, 20 years out, I think they could really um, give that, that perspective to be more present and, and cognizant of how special a time this is in your life. 
So it sounds like there's a lot of preparation for the actual event, the, the athletic part of the event. How much preparation, if any, is given to the post experience um, and how to navigate that when you're training? Really nothing. It's something that I liken to in a weird way dying. You know, we all know we're going to die, but we don't plan for it. We don't prepare for it. It doesn't really feel tangible. Uh, and I think that moment that I was, you know, on the Olympic podium uh, where I had won a silver medal uh, and I was staring at the US flag, I couldn't have ever imagined like the day after, you know, it's like, I only saw 2006 end of February and I couldn't contemplate March. You know, it just, it was such a hurdle that everything my whole life was focused for would somehow end and, and what would be on the other side of that. Uh, and, and so I think there was no preparation for that. And it was almost like, you'll deal with that when that comes, but that's not what matters. What matters is every moment leading up to the apex of February, 2020 or 20, 2006. And how I perform, how I show up in those moments will define how I feel about myself for the rest of my life. Yeah. That's a very nice segue into the next um, sections we picked out from the film. So let's watch a couple of more and then we'll, we'll talk. A couple of very powerful sections of the film. It seems that despite the outcome, what I hear from those clips is whether one gets a gold or leaves with a big disappointment that there is this sense of emptiness, a hole that's created but what is by what is no longer there to take up space. Um, and to me, as a psychologist, that sounds like a grieving process. It's, it's dealing with grief. And so one of the steps to work through grief is to make sense of what happened over time, to give it some personal meaning, meaning out of um, the experience, to be able to find the silver lining. So I wonder, Sasha, if you would agree with that, um, and if you know the, the challenging recollections you have um, have led you to, to a silver lining and if there's a powerful personal lesson that you've learned that you may not have otherwise if the outcome of that particular event or a um, combination of events were different. I think what I have realized over the last decade and it's, it's really been a continued evolution and process. It's certainly, um, 2006 is what, four, 14 years ago, and I'm still uncovering new insights every day. And I think the biggest takeaway is that without pain and without disappointment, you don't ask questions and you don't dig deeper, at least in my personal experience. I don't wanna make that a blanket statement for everyone. And you know, in the moments of my life where I've been disappointed and it hasn't gone the way that I wanted it to, um, I really ask questions not only in the moment of what am I doing wrong with training and what are the expectations and like how do I deal with all these emotions that are coming up because I um, have not done what I had hoped to do. But ten years later, you know, thinking about because I had this struggle and this pain, I it opened up other avenues and doors of inquiries. I, I look towards Buddhism. I look towards meditation. I look towards therapy to better understand myself. And I think ultimately that has led to a much richer life experience and better self-knowledge, like who I am and what makes me happy. And, and not only that, but this cycle that you are conditioned too, that you're not even entirely aware of because it starts at such a young age that if I do well and I get a gold medal, people will write nice things about me in a newspaper and people will feel like I met the expectations that were put upon me and I will get endorsements and it will be this, you know, this continuous circle of love and happiness. And when something goes wrong and that breaks, then all of a sudden you, you kind of ask yourself, what am I training myself emotionally to do? And it was really, I need to do well so I don't disappoint people so that they like me, so that I'm included, so that I'm enough. And it's this 
this circle that, you know, sport, you know, doesn't necessarily intend to do, but there is a best, there is one moment to be the best and you're judged um, globally. And it's, it's, it's very, you know, even in a subjective sport, it's objective. It's not like life where it goes on over time. And, and so I've learned to kind of question the assumptions of what makes me happy and why I do things. And I think ultimately that has led to like a richer experience. Now we're, we're creatures of habit. And so when we take away something that was such a large source of emotional supply, whether that supply is good or bad, that, that vacuum has to be filled with something else. Um, so in a sense, you know, a lot of our behaviors are driven by that need to, to emotionally nurture and, and nourish ourselves. And some habits are applaudable. So if someone wakes up in the morning and um, they have to run five miles before they get their day going, we applaud that and we think that's healthy. Whereas someone else may wake up every morning and have to smoke a cigarette and that we call an addiction, but they both uh, ultimately attend to some emotional need on some very core biological level. And I know I'm simplifying the picture a little bit, but if we remove that source of emotional input, that, that again, that need needs to be replaced by something else. And that's what I hear in the, the clips that we just talked about. And at this very elite level, everything is, is exaggerated, right? So that the emotional supply is very, very unidimensionally focused and very intense. And so when that goes away, the hole that's left is quite gaping too. Um, and I also imagine that maybe in a smaller subset, the role of that, that intense focus that the sport provides, um, maybe a, a masking of some other pain, um, mental health challenge or emotional injury from childhood or trauma so that that singular focus becomes a coping mechanism to deal with, with emotional pain. So when that's taken away, the core issue then still remains unaddressed. And if someone hasn't learned to, to deal with that, then, um, then you see that really big gaping space that needs to be filled. And I, Michael Phelps talked about, you know, I'm just a swimmer. And so if I'm not swimming, then who am I? And where does that identity, uh, how does that identity change? So what would you suggest to gifted athletes who are on track to be elites um, to help them diversify that, that emotional input, um, if that's even possible, so that they have more of a robust safety net so that they can transition um, out of that singular focus and be able to um, live comfortably and um, feel fulfilled. I find in my experience, the team athletes and the college athletes uh, are best equipped, I think, to transition in the most healthy way. And I think it's because they're either older and they're having a college experience and competing later in life and have had maybe more formative experiences at a younger age that are not kind of solely in this pressure cooker. Um, and then having the support of a team if you're um, a team athlete. But you know, aside from that, if you're a 13 year old gymnast um, trying to make the Olympics at 15, that, that's a tough spot in terms of the expectation, the window where your body will be um, most competitive and, and just the mental pressure. And, and, and it's very difficult. I think having good family and friend support network, being able to reach out to an older athlete who has been there before, has been in your exact shoes, I think is probably the most helpful to know that there is life after this and it's just one chapter. It seems like the only chapter that's important at that time and will define everything else after that. Um, and, and to maybe take a little time for other interests, which is so hard to do because when I wasn't skating, I was at Pilates or the track or physical therapy or watching videos of myself skating or other skaters to try to get better. And you feel guilty that if you're spending time thinking about something else, that's time that could have been, you know, directed towards being the best athlete in this short time window you have. Um, so I guess the advice would be to find someone who's been there before 
and who's maybe 10 years out and they can really give you perspective that there is life after this um, and, and the best way to kind of show up and be your best and kind of satisfied and fulfilled with this era of your life. Why don't we transition and watch the next um, segment of the film? You know, suicide is such a sensitive topic and timely topic. It's the second leading cause of death in youth followed just after accidental injuries. Um, and I think it's one of the most socially contagious behaviors. It's and the role of the media and how um, a suicide is sensationalized um, really fuels that contagious aspect of, um, of the behavior. How common is um, this level of despond despondency, Sasha, in, at the high level of training that you're familiar with? I think what's so, I guess, difficult about this um, situation is that it's hidden from view. Uh, people that are having these thoughts, these emotions um, within the athletic arena are not sharing them. Um, you know, I think for a long time and even to some extent today, mental health has been stigmatized, but especially as an elite athlete, you can't even admit normal fears uh, and insecurities to yourself because you know that it will undermine your own performance. And so despite feeling terrified and wanting to cry and unprepared um, because you're injured, you you fake it till you make it. And you, you say that you're ready, you're prepared, you're strong, you're not going to show any weakness to anyone because admitting that would uh, take away some of your confidence. It would be admitting that it's real. Um, and I, in my experience, any anxiety, nerves, depression, fear has always been um, squashed down and silenced as much as possible. And so I think that makes it very, very tough for people that are suicidal and athletes that are suffering to the extent that Speedy did. And, and it, it's, it takes a tremendous amount of bravery and courage to open up to. And I think we need channels. Um, we need people actively reaching out to athletes so they don't have to be the first one to initiate that. And, and feel vulnerable in that, but to say that this is okay, we're checking in, how are you doing, we're here. Um, and I think that would be incredibly helpful because in my experience, when I was competing, people didn't talk about this. People hid any insecurities that they had because they felt that it would undermine their performance and confidence as an athlete. You know, that section um, where Jeremy talks about feeling guilty and wanting to have an opportunity to go back, I think really highlights the importance of knowing how to respond when someone uh, approaches us with thoughts of self-harm or, or suicide. And I think it's important to remember that most of the time when they come to us like that, they're looking for a sense of hope or to feel a sense of connection or belonging. That's, that's essentially what they're um, needing. Um, and then reminder at that time about things that they're looking forward to or they're excited about will all be helpful. Um, the other thing to remember is that talking about suicide doesn't cause suicide. So there's um, some uh, concern that if we ask someone if they're suicidal or check back with them to see if they're okay, that just the mere act of bringing that topic up may be um, encouraging them to take an action. And that does, that's not supported by how um, suicidal behaviors work. But at the end of the day, I think it's really critical to remember that um, if someone does reach out to you with um, a suicidal thought or that level of despondency, that one shouldn't feel like they're alone and have to shoulder that burden all by themselves. Um, to know that they can reach out to professional hotlines, to professionals in the community, to trusted other mentors or adults in the, in the community, um, either by themselves or, or with the person who just disclosed to them. Um, I think are really important things, things to remember. I wonder, Sasha, if you may have some input um, 
about what some fundamental differences may be between those elite athletes who fare well emotionally and those that do end up falling into uh, a despair. Difference in personality or sport or in what, what capacity? In any capacity. It's, it's one of those things that is, I would have to, it's so hard to say because athletes hide so much. I think that is in some ways when they compete, that is their strength that they can bottle up and push down overwhelming fear of having to do something on a world stage in a moment. And because of that, they also can bottle up and push down their suicide their suicidal thoughts or their, you know, extreme depression. And so it's, it's a two edged sword. Um, and so, do you know, Jeremy had this experience with speedy, but I, I've never had um, a personal experience like that with another athlete. And again, I, I think, and I hope that's changing as mental health becomes, um, you know, something that we talk about more and it's okay to not be okay. And this film is making a huge difference, but, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people, especially athletes, we're not talking about this. And so I can't say that I know which are the athletes that have dealt with this and that didn't, that in fact, I'm surprised how well so many athletes have hidden it that, you know, later out have come out um, and who have severely suffered. Like who would have thought that Michael Phelps was one of those athletes? Yeah, that's a great segue to the next section. I wanted to spend a little bit of time to talk about the mental health stigma. So why don't we watch the next um, clip and then continue continue on the topic. Right, I imagine that um, that's part of that message related in that segment is what you were hoping to communicate. Um, is there anything about the stigma of mental health that you became aware of in the making of this film that's different from what you had expected? <clears throat> Um, I, I think that the, obviously I, I, I thought I knew kind of how things worked in the Olympic world to some degree, because I had this up close and personal look at, you know, I traveled with the U S ski team, the Olympic team for several months in Europe and had gone to numerous Olympics, um, you know, along with, with an athlete, Bodie Miller. Um, but I, I was just really wrong. I mean, the U S ski team is is funded at a level and has certain resources. A lot of the other teams don't. I mean, Sasha made a, a really good point tonight and something we don't usually think about, which is certain athletes, like if you're a gymnast, you can get a scholarship and go to UCLA and have somewhat of a normal college experience, including your education and social life. If you're a figure skater, you know, I, I saw it firsthand when we interviewed Gracie Gold for this film. You know, you're training at a facility that's oftentimes in the middle of nowhere. You're being homeschooled. I mean, Sasha, for example, ended up going to Columbia later in life and, and getting, you know, that education. But, you know, she had to, to miss out on that when she was of college age. Um, but again, I mean, just realize, I think that I see these Olympians as a representation of, of all of us in a way. We live in such a competitive you know, take no, take no bars or whatever the expression is, um, uh, culture that's so focused on winning and results. And I think through the eyes of these Olympians, we all have the opportunity to take a fresh look at, at, you know, what we get up for in the morning and how we define our own, our own, uh, successes. Were there any challenges to accessing athletes or, getting certain messages across, for example, if there are sensitive topics about suicidality or anything else like that, that um, you found were hurdles in making the film? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were dealing with working with numerous families who had lost their children to, to death. Um, I mean, for, for the Holcomb family, it was a relatively, it was, it was a fresh tragedy for the Peterson family, it was something that was, you know, years ago, but is still, of course, an extremely sensitive subject. Um, 
And, and even, you know, certain athletes in the film, I think, had were hesitant to to talk about this stuff. There's certain athletes that uh, I won't use any names didn't show up for their their interviews um, who we, you know, were persistent about and rescheduled with. And I think would say they're glad they participated. Um, yeah, it was a, a very challenging subject to tackle. Um, but I, I'm really, you know, pleased with, with the way it turned out. I'm incredibly grateful to, first of all, the athletes and, and HBO and, and everybody who supported it because, um, you know, with all the attention it's gotten and all the media exposure it got, um, you know, we, we we're confident that it's, it's saved some lives and we just hope to do, to do more of that. Did the topic of suicidality come up? Um, more often than what's depicted in the, the film? Um, not necessarily. I think that the athletes who have chosen to disclose that that's something they've dealt with, you know, we included that. Um, but, you know, there were sensitivities there and, and it was important to us to make sure that all the athletes and ultimately the, the film is entirely athletes. There were earlier versions that did have mental health professionals. And we, we ultimately decided with HBO to have it entirely through the voice of the athletes uh, with Michael both being interviewed twice and narrating it. Um, but it was really important for us that the athletes felt comfortable with uh, the final product and, and hopefully we accomplished that. There's um, Sasha, you make some really eloquent points about the risks of being vulnerable. Um, so I'm a psychologist. So when I talk to young people about vulnerability, I talk about it as a necessity, um, as a critical piece of the equation for emotional health and, and mental health, and that it takes strength and courage to be vulnerable. And if we can harness that strength, then um, we can teach things like grit and resilience and all the wonderful things we want young people to learn. But as I hear you talk, it sounds like this kind of thinking is strictly at odds with what you described. You know, you talk about um, it's like war, that there's, um, it's about strategy in the game, and that the last thing you may want to do is show the world your weaknesses. So I'm wondering how um, and if there's room in creating some space for vulnerability to, to be able to be both vulnerable and strong and impervious like, like you suggested? And to what would need to change for that to be possible? So interesting. You know, I don't have all the answers and a few things are coming to mind. One, it's, it's very hard to be vulnerable as a public figure, but there are certain athletes that I think have done a tremendous job at that, like Andre Agassi. Uh, and I find that it's essential to be vulnerable as a private person. And I think I've struggled with that, um, you know, not so much now, but coming off the Olympic games when I was more recognized and feeling if I was you know, out in public or I turned 21 and I couldn't like, you know, have too much fun that I was being watched and I wasn't just a person. People are like, oh, that's that ice skater. And if she does something just a normal, you know, college student would do, like, we're going to talk about it and it's, it's gossip and it's weird. And so you felt as a public figure, you needed to be on your guard and that you're being watched and you're, you're accountable and, and everyone is like trying to pry inside and you just need a fortress. But then, you know, over the last 14 years, I've really done a, a tremendous amount of personal work and just the need to be vulnerable and to express that and to have a community that I can, I can share that with and feel safe. But that's, that's been tremendously hard to do. And I think for me, it's just become easier as I've moved further and further away from the spotlight and kind of matured um, and just realized, you know, how, how important that is. And I think people like Brene Brown and this importance of being vulnerable and even, you know, certain celebrity culture today, like Chrissy Teigen who shared, you know, the loss of her child, um, that we need that. We need public figures that are vulnerable. And I think in terms of the athletic world, I think Andre Agassi was like 
a huge um, kind of role model. And, you know, now Michael Phelps as well, but I think it's rare to find an athlete able to do that while they are still competing. Brett, has um, there been any response from the Olympics or any of the professional sports training organizations to the film and the, the messaging in the film? Yeah, so the, the film, you know, in certain ways is not always complementary to the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. And, and, you know, I felt that my job was to, to channel some of the frustrations of, of the athletes who, um, you know, as I mentioned before, I, I was frankly surprised that A, had these frustrations and B, were, were willing to talk about them. But that's how change happens. And, um, you know, the Olympic structure is, um, it's a complicated one. There's numerous levels to it. There's the International Olympic Committee, there's the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, and then each sport has its own federation or national governing body. Um, so nothing's going to happen overnight. But when it comes to mental health, you know, first of all, we, um, we included some messaging at the end of the film where not only for some, some resources, weightofgoldresources.com that we worked with HBO to, to create, but also where Olympians could go for specific resources. Now, in terms of those resources, the athletes would know better than I, but um, I know that in the, you know, the film just came out uh, July 29th, and already there's been uh, a couple million dollars that was raised and has been dedicated to better mental health services for the American Olympic athletes. So it seems to be headed in the right direction, but it's something that um, is a work in progress and, and will continue to be. You know, changing stigma in, in any field feels like moving mountains at times. It's, it's doable, but it takes a concerted amount of effort from lots of different directions. I, I, you know, I come from the field of concussion and sports, and although there's still quite a bit of work to be done, um, the needle has started moving a um, little bit at a time, especially recently. Um, but it seems like it takes both a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach to move that needle in terms of the stigma um, related to, to mental health. So when I say top down, it's, you know, it involves policy changes, legislation at some levels, um, educational programming, and again, the, the media, I can't stress the uh, important huge role that the role of the, the media has in terms of messaging and how much and how information that's conveyed is, is absorbed. But then there's a bottom-up change also that needs to occur. And this is the microstructure, um, the microculture of peer-to-peer -peer interactions in athletes, uh, how junior athletes relate to um, more experienced um, athletes, role modeling, and the day-to-day -day interpersonal interactions between athletes and coaches. Um, I wonder, Sasha, what you think it would take to chip away at the stigma, at least from the, the bottom-up perspective, and how much role trainers and coaches and peers um, have in helping reshape how mental health is approached? I think it needs to come from the top, from the organization, and not only from the organization, but I think role models, elite athletes that are also competing. Uh, and I think, I think that's, that's a tough um, burden to put on those athletes, but even if some, if it's someone like Michael Phelps and if someone can decide to kind of look under the rug and deal with those demons while they're competing and prove that they're coming out stronger, that they're resolving something and therefore they're less haunted by this fear of failure, this fear of expectation, this overwhelming anxiety, and actually show that that ties into them being a more confident, stronger athlete. Sadly, like it, it has to come back to performance in that way. I don't think any athlete that has dedicated their life to something 
is willing to look under the hood if that's gonna if they feel like they're not sure what's gonna happen because of that they're like okay later i'll get to psychotherapy and i'll deal with this later we you know as a society we love to procrastinate and deal with the hard things later so i think what we need to see um you know our role models our athletes dealing with these issues in real time and showing that because of that they're coming back stronger um and so i think that's the example that younger athletes need today i think that comment about sort of procrastinating dealing with the tough stuff is a really timely one um regardless of who we, we are whether we're, we're elite athletes or um, junior athletes or any member of society however we group ourselves we can't escape emotions right so the the harder we try to avoid them or to ignore them the more we seem to be chased by them it feels like um, and we also can't selectively numb them. And we do this as a culture really, really well, right? With social media or with substance use or a number of things that we do to, to numb things. But if we choose to numb and ignore emotions, um, we can't only do that with the bad emotions, the ones we don't want. We, then we inherently also um, don't allow ourselves to feel the, the positive ones, the, the ones that we do want. Um, so I know that the film is focused on elite athletes and it raises a lot of questions about mental health and stigma and access, but the message from the film really applies to not only every athlete, but everyone who strives for um, a, a goal. Um, and I think the film highlights the intensity and the gravity of the situation um, and the stakes are quite high, but the emotions and the consequences of the stigma are really universal and apply to our, our culture in general. Um, why don't we watch the, the next section and then continue chatting some more? And there's some really important messaging there. Are there resources that either of you are aware of um, for athletes of all levels to help them with the, the emotional consequences and stresses of um, performance and com competing? Currently existing today? I think it's very different um, within each sport, which within each national governing body. And, you know, I'm, I have to say that I'm 14 years away from that. You know, I competed last in 2010 though, but not at the Olympic level. And I think it's it's something that governing bodies are aware of, that it's, it's something that's it's important. And I think it's beginning to be discussed. I don't think the resources are really in place yet, but I think the conversation is being had um, and it's no longer, you know, the, the pink elephant in the room. And so I think that that is a huge step in itself. Um, and something I wanted to touch upon that I think it, it's a difficult um, expectation or burden we are placing on young athletes if we can hope that they can be more emotionally aware is that most people kind of deal with the difficult things in their life much later on when they have that self-awareness and that um, some kind of experience and this maturity to kind of analyze how they feel and who they are. And, and how, how does a 12 year old do that? How does a 16 year old do that? They're just growing into their bodies and trying to figure out who they are and fit into their social groups. And that's just a normal teenager, you know, let alone the, the expectations of an elite athlete. And so you know, a lot of the people that I admire and look up to now are these Buddhist teachers that are 70 years old and incredibly wise because they've had a lifetime to reflect on pain and disappointment and what's ultimately this kind of illusion of who they're supposed to be. And so I would, I think the conversation is the right place to start and bringing it to schools um, so that you can have a fifth grader um, begin to be aware of their feelings and what is prompting these feelings. And I think until we start to become aware of our own emotions and what 
what prompts certain feelings within us, you know, it, it takes years to kind of find that path on your own. Brett, is this um, addressing the mental health stigma a passion of yours? And is this something that you'd like to explore in, in your next film? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the effect this film has had so far and, you know, it's going to be on, on HBO for the next 10 years. Um, I'm sure HBO would appreciate for me to say HBO Max because that's the new, the new HBO that um, this and many other fantastic films are available on now. Check with your local, local cable provider. Um, no, I, I would love to do more of this kind of work. Um, I think that what we did in the Olympic world, I'd like to replicate uh, in other sports. We're already talking to, um, you know, some major stars from, from different sports worlds that have chosen to, um, you know, be public about, about this issue. Um, we're actually uh, fundraising now. Uh, if you go to, we started a nonprofit so that we could do these kinds of projects um, without having to get, you know, funding and permission from corporate networks per se, at least for the, in the early stages. So if anybody's interested, uh, podiumsociety.org is the website. And we have uh, what we call the Podium Project season one uh, available now for um, looking for, you know, executive producers on that. Now, I, I think we've just, it's just the tip of the iceberg starting with Sasha and these other athletes. The Olympics was a great place to start because it's the best of the best in the world, it's a global event. Um, and they go through some really specific challenges uh, with the every four years and, and a number of other unique things. But no, I, I'm, uh, I feel very called to uh, do more of these types of stories. There's a question from the audience, um, maybe both of you can address about the financial insecurity post-Olympics that may be very different compared to other professional players and athletes. Can you speak a little bit about how that plays into the anxiety and security and the stresses post-performance? Brett, did you wanna take this specifically about Steven? I know you had- Yeah, I mean, I, I, there were a number of, kind of shocking moments when I was interviewing the athletes and, you know, Sasha, I think maybe the first one was, was with you where, you know, you mentioned that how quickly after you competed that you lost your insurance. Um, I just, I had all these perceptions of what it meant to be an Olympic athlete and an American Olympic athlete. I assumed, you know, you watch all the uh, Olympians walk out together at opening ceremonies and I'm thinking, all right, you have your, your Michael Phelps and your Sean White who are, you know, in the, in the stratosphere in terms of their endorsements and so forth, but they're all wearing Nike. They're all wearing polo. They've got to at least I'll be getting like, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollars for this. And then, you know, I come to find out that that's couldn't be further from the truth. And, um, well, Sasha can, you can speak to it better than I, I mean, what are the realities for, for a figure skater if they're not, you know, a household name. It, it really runs the gamut in, in sport. And there are the athletes like Michael Phelps and Sean White who have million dollar endorsements. And then there are the athletes that are working um, full time to, to pay for their sport because they have minimal funding from their national governing bodies and minimal support from the Olympic committee. And, they'll go to the Olympics that maybe they'll get seventh place. They'll come home, their life won't be any different. And they'll, you know, go back to whatever job that they were working. And it's really a, a lifetime of investing in this dream and, and financially as well, having to pay for that. And so I think it, it's really difficult, especially when you're layering on these mental health, um, you know, issue, issues that every athlete deals with, at least in some capacity, that your health insurance also goes six months after you're retired. And a figure skater in some instances is, you know, more lucky than, than other athletes because we also 
can do shows and kind of perform and we're entertainers as well as just athletes. And so we have this vehicle to uh, continue to earn a living uh, at least in, in some capacity and, and pay the bills, but it paying for your coach, paying for your costumes, your boots, and just, you know, I think one of the biggest costs was physical therapy and doctors. And, you know, you think you're going to have great all encompassing insurance, but it, you, you don't, and your physical therapy allotment runs out. And when you go every day and you have ionophoresis and expensive treatments uh, daily, it, it really racks up. So everything that you're usually earning and prize money and, and small endorsements is it's plugging right back into the sport. Um, you know, if you're one of the lucky ones and doesn't have to work an additional job to, to make en ends meet for your sport. Is there anything else, Brett, that you discovered or, or um, came upon as you were making the film that surprised you? No, I mean, just again, the, um, the candor of the athletes, um, you know, being willing to, to talk about the things they did um, just means so much to me. And I think probably everybody who's seen the film, I really do think it's a incredibly stigma busting piece of, of, of media. Um, I really, I really believe that. And the way that the, the media has embraced it from everybody from the New York times to Anderson Cooper to, Rolling Stone magazine, it, it crossed over um, the threshold of, of sports and even entertainment. And, um, you know, with, with everything that everybody's dealing with right now because of this pandemic, I, I sure hope it, it helps people. And I sure hope that people can see themselves in these Olympians. And I hope that as a, as a society, we start to make ourselves more vulnerable and to make it much easier to be able to get quality mental health. Um, I think telehealth can play a huge role in that right now it needs to. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I envision a world where everybody feels comfortable talking about uh, the issues that are bothering them as mild or as severe as they can may be both with family and friends and with professionals who can help them address it. So, you know, having a film like this that displays how vulnerable some of these giant role models are for young people is, is a stepping stone. And I hope to continue the, the conversation. Acknowledging the issue is a very big critical piece. Um, and then taking steps after that to be able to put the puzzle pieces together to make some change, even if it is slow. But I think a film like this um, puts it in context and the um, attention that it's getting hopefully will start the, to move the tide in, in a different direction. So I really appreciate, Sasha, your candid uh, conversation. And Brett, this um, film is exceptionally done. Looking forward to future works. Um, do you want to tell the audience how they can watch the film if they're not able to? Um, I think one of the, the audience questions were whether they can watch it internationally. Is there other ways of accessing the film that aren't readily available through the, the website or HBO? No, right now it's exclusively available on, on all of HBO's platforms. Uh, and we're currently working on finding international partners. I think it actually premiered in Israel last night. I have this movie poster behind me. I have a, a Hebrew version of that on the way, but no, we hope to get it out um, all over the world and, and, you know, to make it as accessible to as many people as possible. Terrific. Are there any closing comments either one of you want to make? Just thank you so much for this platform to speak and and share this story. Um, you know, it's been a long time in the making and um, having the opportunity to work with Brett on this has been really tremendous and incredibly therapeutic personally to have an outlet to process and, and talk about this. Again, we put all these feelings in a box. And so in some way to share my experience and hopefully have that be 
um, some helpful stepping stones to others that are suffering or feeling the pressure that the biggest thing to know that they're not alone. And I think making this film made me realize how many tremendous athletes are also struggling and just dealing with this sense of loss of identity. And I think just in that alone, that community um, is um, a, a huge help. Yeah, agreed. I, I think about, you know, a panel that, that Sasha and I did in New York with Michael Phelps some months ago and how affected and blown away Michael was to, uh, to realize that, that he wasn't alone among his uh, Olympic brothers and sisters and what he had experienced. And I hope the film helps everybody uh, feel that they're not so alone when they might be suffering and that, you know, there is, there, there are solutions. Um, thanks to, uh, to you guys for hosting this and look forward to some continued uh, dialogue about this subject. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. Brett, thank you for bringing us this powerful, inspiring, and moving documentary film. Sasha, thank you for sharing your personal experience and your insights. And Talon, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. We hope you will all join us on Wednesday, December 9th for the Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health with Drs. Rita Walker and Gail Wyatt. We wish you and your family happy and healthy holidays. Good evening. <laughs>